Perfect. Okay, so welcome everyone to this uh, second of our, our lecture series in interior design and interior architecture. Um, as for the first one, I'll be taking, car taking charge of all the technological stuff. Um, so as we go through the, the lecture, if you have any questions at any point, you can send in them to uh, using the Q&A option on, on uh, Zoom. Um, and if, if you just have them at the end, that's fine too, but I'll be giving you a voice once we are at this point at the end, but you can, you can end, uh, send in your questions throughout. And I'll share a link uh, for AIA uh, CEUs in a few minutes. Uh, just the information actually, you, you send, you send your, your name and AIA number to Max Underwood if you wanna receive CEU for this. Um, so otherwise, I'm handing it to uh, Sherry J Jacobs, who will introduce our speaker for today, and I'll get back to you at the end of the talk. Okay. Thank you, Olivier. Um, so I have the pleasure of introducing Audrey Handelman to um, our lecture today. Um, Audrey comes to us from Joshua Tree today. Um, she's um, part of the Gensler Los Angeles office. She's a senior associate there. Um, she's also the director of design resilience of their Southwest region. Um, and she really looks at the intersection of sustainability and social justice in design. Um, so very interesting. Um, I had um, the a uh, unique opportunity to collaborate with Audrey, um, along with Jose Bernardi and Olivier um, in developing a, a studio topic, an interior design studio topic um, that um, our, our studio focused on health and wellness. And um, Audrey's work became inspirational for us um, in designing a class that focused on providing health services and shelter for those experiencing homelessness in the Phoenix Valley. And her work specifically was, the, the project specifically was El Pueblo in Los Angeles, um, which is a phenomenal project um, and the first of its kind in LA where um, the team, um, took simple construction trailers and um, gathered them together on a site in LA and provided shelter um, for those experiencing homelessness in Los Angeles. And um, integrated into that some really simple and beautiful design solutions like outdoor spaces, providing community spaces, and also integrating art into um, the experience. So it was really amazing. Um, so we, um, you know, with the connection uh, through Gensler, specifically, um, you know, my connection with the um, Gensler Phoenix office and, and Don Hart, and connecting us to Audrey and her work, um, they really um, provided inspiration for us in developing that class. And then we were able to partner with other local firms such as um, um, Kelly Bauer with White Box Studio and many other local designers to act as mentors for our students. And it was a success. Um, and really Audrey's work was the catalyst to that success. Um, so we thank you very much for that. Um, Audrey's currently working on some phenomenal projects. Um, just talking to her is inspirational. Um, she and her team are working on a research project at Gensler where they're really, you know, just boiled down. They're kind of like asking smart questions um, about design, but that have to do with policy. Um, so asking good questions and asking them to the right people and then hopefully um, impacting policy and making change. Um, so very, very interesting kind of design topics that she's researching. Um, and she's doing all of this um, on top of her normal day-to-day um, -day responsibilities as an architect, 
at Gensler. Um, so much of her work is pro bono. Um, so it's all on top of her daily responsibilities. So she's making a tremendous impact in the um, architecture and design um, field. So we thank you very much for um, your dedication and ins your inspiration to us. Um, and then also thank you very much for joining us today um, for the lecture. So with that, I'll hand it over to Audrey. Thank you so much and welcome. Thank you, Cherry. That was such a wonderful uh, introduction and thank you for having me here. I'm really excited to share this project with you. Uh, let me go ahead and share my screen. Um, maybe Olivier or Ray, you could give me control of the screen. It should work now. Okay, thanks. Okay. Um, can you verify that you see the screen just to check? All good, thank okay, you. Okay, great. Uh, so today I'm gonna share with you a very small uh, project that had a very big impact on a community. Uh, this is Luz and Lupita. And the market I'm gonna talk about is Lupita's Market, um, something that she's owned and operated for over two decades in uh, a small community outside of downtown Los Angeles. Before I dive in though, I wanted to do a quick land acknowledgement. And uh, I spoke with Cherry about this before we did it. And I think most uh, folks at ASU have not potentially seen one of these. This is something that's become really pervasive in the social justice movement, and it's simply acknowledging the land on which you're speaking or talking about. So um, in this case, there's three places, right? Um, a lot of you are probably in Phoenix from ASU, and so I went ahead and listed the tribes that are from uh, that, that area and that land. Lupita's Corner, the uh, project that I'll be sharing is in Los Angeles. So you can see the tribes listed there for them. And then as Jerry mentioned, I'm actually in Joshua Tree right now. So we have uh, the tribes listed for those as well. And um, if anyone has more questions about land acknowledgements, um, at the end of this, I can go ahead and share some resources and tell you a little bit more about it. So one of the reasons that the land acknowledgement is so important to this project is not because it has to do necessarily with indigenous culture, but it does have to do with um, recognizing a generational history. And you see two of those generations right here on the screen. Um, and cultural heritage is important. And it's really something that this, the program around this project tried to um, celebrate. So, Here's the humble watermelon. Um, and even though it's sort of a catchy title for a lecture, um, it is actually Luz, the owner's favorite um, fruit. And it speaks to sort of the larger intention of this project, which is to bring more fresh produce to an area that's currently a food desert. So it all started with the LA Food Policy Council. Um, they are a nonprofit in Los Angeles and they have several programs that they run um, centered around food justice. One of them is the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network, HNMN. Um, and as you can see, they work to empower local corner sto store owners to be healthy food re retail retailers. And they do this um, through several ways. Um, but they're really focusing on solving this large problem that, you know, of course is not unique to Los Angeles, but within Los Angeles, 31% of people do not usually have access to affordable fresh fruits and vegetables. In low income and communities of color, there are tons of fast food options, very few healthy restaurant options. And of course, in you know, BIPOC communities, there is higher instances of diabetes. So this is the problem they're looking to solve. And their solution um, focuses on these corner stores and these businesses and growing the, the small markets that previously would sell mostly junk food, liquor, and cigarettes to sell uh, a wider variety of foods and hopefully much healthier foods. So they've, they've worked with over 50 store owners in these um, 
these these projects that the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network takes on. And as you can see, there's six projects that are considered transformation projects. And that's where design comes in. A lot of these projects are focused mostly on helping the store owners with their business model and um, their sourcing of food. But a few of them, they get into the actual design of the space. So here's what our space used to look like from the exterior. Um, as you can see, it's on a corner and it's a relatively busy corner close to downtown Los Angeles in a neighborhood called Westlake. In the bottom right corner, you can see that this is actually a historic building. I don't have the date these photos were taken, but if anyone wants to like zoom in and take a look at those, those cars, you can, you can wager a guess um, in the chat box. Uh, so there's, there's some history here that we wanted to make sure to preserve both for the actual building, but then also this market, as I mentioned, has been here for decades and the community really knows it as the corner store that they stop at for um, groceries and snacks and um, especially kids. I'll get to that in a minute. On the upper right, you see that next door, there's a, a new sort of um, modern boutique hotel being built there. And that's important not only for the design aesthetic, but also for the function of the market. This hotel will not have any food and beverage services. So the market itself has the opportunity to become the place where the guests um, come for breakfast or lunch or a snack. These are some interior shots of what it used to look like. There are, as you can see, some fresh produce options. It wasn't completely void of that, but it, is really a lot of non-perishables and junk food. And more than anything else, it's just very dark and cluttered in this space. Uh, this shows you the location um, in relation to our Gensler office, which is downtown, but it also more importantly shows you the location in relation to schools. So uh, this is on a corner and the other three corners are schools. So in the mornings before school and then after school, the market is just flooded with children uh, getting snacks. And Luz, the owner, really wanted to be able to provide healthier options for all the kids that come in to get snacks for themselves and also shop for groceries for their family. So as we sort of dove into the design of this, we put forth some goals that we worked out with the owner you know, something a little more modern, more open space, uh, increasing produce selection maintaining WIC product quantities. If you're not familiar with WIC, this stands for Women, Infant, and Children, and it's a specific government-run program that focuses on things like baby formula and diapers being available in communities. Um, we wanted to incorporate interior seating. We wanted people to spend more time in this space. Uh, Luz has ambitions of teaching community classes on cooking and healthy eating. So having a space for that was really important. Um, incorporating sort of modern signage into it. And then the design concept really was gonna be focused around the natural and earthy sort of farmer's market feel. So this all boiled down to the big concept of something that's timeless and healthy. Um, we want to incorporate historic influences, but also cater to modern users with healthy and bright offerings. So then we went into a programmatic analysis. As you can see, it's a, it's a small space. It's less than a thousand square feet, um, but it's really, it used to be really jumbled and crowded and there were tall shelves and product everywhere. And we started to break down what kind of products were where, and there was very little sort of organization. Things were kind of in different places and you didn't necessarily know where to find things. One of the biggest opportunities we had is, as you can see in the lower left, um, POS stands for point of sale for those who aren't in sort of the retail world. Um, the point of sale is in the lower left corner of the plan, but in the center of the plan, let's see if we can see my mouse, is actually this whole deli prep food area. So those were separated and this point of sale was actually very tucked in and hard to see. So not only is it um, a user experience opportunity, but it's also an opportunity to have better security for the location. So here we break down those, pro those program elements uh, just into percentages and 
you know, we're showing what the program at that point was current and the proposed program. And as you can see here, uh, we are proposing to merge the point of sale with the food prep area. So if there's an em only one employee, which is oftentimes the case, if they need to make a sandwich for someone, they don't need to leave the cast register to go do that. And then of course, some of the, you know, more obvious things with a healthy neighborhood market program, like increasing the fresh produce. You can also see we're adding the seating element. This is a little bit of the before and after programmatic analysis. Um, you can see we've worked to create zones. So as you first enter, you have a bit of a decompression zone that has the majority of the fresh produce and the seating. As you get deeper into the space, you are more into some of the packaged non-perishable goods and then um, some of the household goods farther in the back. Again, this sort of central area on the left side of the plan is that deli prep area that we're turning also into the point of sale. So we had a design charrette with our entire studio. We have about, I wanna say like 20, 25 people in our studio. So the design team hosted a bit of a brainstorming session and we came up with this, these concept images that would really speak to how we wanted the final uh, space to look. So warm, timeless, clean, inviting. And you see a lot of uh, the wood and natural materials come through in some of these concept images. It was also important for it to be joyful and colorful. Uh, so finding ways to incorporate that was important to both the design team and the owner. And here's where we start to get into actually the final plan and final layout after sort of considering both the concepts and the programmatic analysis. Uh, this gives you a clearer sense of the front doors down at the bottom of the plan and you come in and you have these zones of mm -hmm seating, fresh produce, and you'll see in the renderings that are coming up, we also did a bit of a sectional analysis so that when you come in, everything's lower. So there's a lot more visibility and the higher shelves are more in the middle and towards the back. Um, for anyone else who this one sort of like offset shelf bothers, we bothers, we actually fixed this during construction and found a way to align all of these shelves. Um, and then here you see the combined deli prep out area and the point of sale right at the center. We oriented these um, shelving units so that anyone standing at the point of sale has a pretty clear view down the aisle um, for security reasons. The other thing we got into was uh, the brand and graphics and signage. So these are some concept images of the, the look and feel we wanted for the graphics. And this was the final product that we proposed. We actually proposed changing the name. Um, it was formerly just Lupita's Market. And we wanted to change it to Lup Lupita's Corner to both celebrate the corner location, but to also just give it a little bit of a refresh while still maintaining Lupita's name in, um, in the title. And Lou's Lupita's daughter loved it. She, she immediately got you know Lupita's Corner Instagram handle and was really excited about kind of the rebranding effort. Um, you can see it's very colorful, modern. We have some icons that, that get incorporated and we created a, a simple and colorful color palette to use throughout the store, both in the graphics and branding and in the interior um, paint colors and design. Here we get into some materials, um, just starting to establish a bit of a look and feel around the natural materials, uh, some colorful materials and paints, and then some geometric patterns. We start to look at options for um, furniture and millwork. We did end up doing some custom millwork for this. And this is an example of one of the spec sheets that we did as part of the design build effort. So as we're developing these designs, we put a sheet like this together. And in the end, we were able to hand this over directly to the contractor. Um, one thing I should mention is one of the big drivers of the design is we did not want to need to get permits. So we didn't ever develop permit documents. We went essentially from this and some of the floor plans and elevations, I think, yeah, on the next slide. So this sort of drawing we produced 
and handed a package to the contractor and they were able to build off of that. As you saw in the previous slide, it was also very close to our office. So we were able to make frequent construction uh, visits to help with anything that came up that we did not resolve in these very incomplete <laughs> design drawings. Um, so this gives you an idea of the level of detail that we were able to hand over to the contractor. And um, this also gives you sort of a nice elevational understanding of the zones we were working on, on creating. This first zone on the left, this elevation is cut um, through, through the long part of the plan and it's looking essentially towards the left wall. So this, this initial sort of community and history area, that's, that's the decompression zone, that's the area where there can be community gathering and feeding and the fresh produce. Once you get into the middle zone, that's where a lot more of the goods are, as well as the deli area and um, point of sale. And then the back area really is more service and storage. So now we get into some of the renderings that we put together. This was also part of the package that we handed over to the contractors. So they had a really clear understanding of the design intent we had. Um, you can see in the lower left corner, if you remember kind of the very opaque patchwork of a facade where there was, you almost could not see into the store at all. So we really tried to open it up. It turns out that all that plywood on the facade was covering beautiful windows that we were able to open up and bring a lot of both natural daylight into the space, but also um, activation to the sidewalk as people walk by, they're interested and they can come in and see what they're coming into. I'm gonna come back to this facade near the end of the presentation. We didn't end up doing this planter box, but we have what I think is actually a better solution for this um, side of the corner. Once you get inside, again, you, get, you start to get the sense of these uh, zones, the produce community zone as you first walk in. Then after that, some more of the um, product. You can see um, one of the ways that we also emphasize these zones are these existing, there are these existing beams. And so to add kind of a punch of color and to define the zones, we you know, highlighted those with paint we have chalkboard paint um, in the middle zone as well for them to be able to print their menu and everything like that. Um, you know, with existing buildings, adaptive reuse projects, tenant improvement projects, you always run into odd conditions. Um, I'll give a shout out to my favorite structural engineer who I know is on this uh, on this call, Mary Myatt. It was very confusing to see these beams not intersect the columns where we thought they would. So the zones and color delineations aren't perfect, but um, we think it ended up turning out really nicely. To speak a little bit about the community and the history of the place, I mean, this was one of the big goals of this project. You know, um, it's great to do a beautiful and fun design project, but it was really meaningful to be able to celebrate the community that uh, this project serves. So um, this community pinup board was intended as, you know, anybody can post anything that they need there. And on the sides, these are framed photos of some of both the historic building photos and photos from Lupita and Luz and her family. And then we get into construction. So everything you saw prior was essentially, we made a big packet and handed it to this very generous contractor build group who um, volunteered a lot of their expertise and services. And um, you know, this is right after they pulled the product out. And I think they, yeah, I think these photos, they stripped out the conduit. One thing, one lesson learned um, is, during design, we didn't pay close attention to the lighting and um, all the electrical, but prior to these photos, there was a web of conduit all over the walls, all over the ceilings. So sort of in real time, we ended up making some design decisions about the lighting and what uh, the ceiling should look like. And we were able to come up with a much more streamlined look for for all of that, all of those systems. And it, it was one of the most surprising design information interventions that made a huge impact on what the space looks like. Here we get a little bit uh, further into the construction process. You see sort of 
you know, getting rid, rid of a lot of the darker, um, heavier paint colors, lightening it up before we put on some of the pops of color, some of the real time decisions on, you know, how to finish the floor, things like that. So now we're gonna get into a couple before and after photos. Here, as you remember, is the facade and here's the final product. Um, one thing I wanna point out is uh, something that we also solved sort of in real time, you know, we wanted, we wanted the facade to be really transparent, um, but there's always the concern about security. And that's why that plywood had been put up in the first place. So we were able to design a detail where the, um, the facade actually pops out a little bit and there's roll down um, security shutters that tuck in behind it. So during the day, it can be really open and inviting and provide a lot of natural daylight. And then when they need to secure the space, it rolls down, but it's invisible during the day, some of the security precautions. So here's um, the point of sale. You can see, you can just barely even see where um, Lupita used to tuck away in here. And um, it was also uh, sort of a counter height point of sale. So she had a chair, but when she was sitting in the chair, you could only really see like maybe her forehead. She'd have to stand up to see customers come in and come out. And here's the new point of sale. And there's Luz, very excited about the new point of sale um, that incorporates the seating. And, and behind her and past her, you see some of the deli prep area. One thing we were, we were able to do was actually save the vast majority of the equipment. Um, I think almost none of the food prep equipment is new. We did shroud some of uh, the deli prep area with millwork, as you can see here. Uh, but for the most part, we were able to reuse a lot of the equipment that was in perfect working condition. It just needed a more cleaned up uh, floor plan. Here's another view of the prep area. Here's what it is now with Lupita. There's some more humble watermelon. Um, some of the previous produce display, it was um, really looked like an afterthought. And, and now there's these custom, these were a few pieces of custom shelving and millwork that we put together for the entry produce display experience. Some more product display and here's, you can see what the product display is now and how you kind of have that direct sight line from the point of sale into some of the product areas. Most of these, by the way, are photos from the grand opening. So you can see kind of the excitement and energy around that. And um, not all of the products are healthy, but um, you know, there's, there's still a few treats for the little ones. One of the things we also did, um, the one of our design principals who is on this project is also uh, an accomplished illustrator, Erwin Miller. And um, instead of having kind of a blank pinup board that's just waiting for people to start pinning up, he ended up doing sort of a graphic um, step and repeat wallpaper that you can pin over as, uh, as an homage to some of, the, some of the, the fresh produce that got incorporated into this area. Um, so it's this, this cheerful backdrop to the community board. Um, you start to see up here some of the, the graphics that, that got applied and um, some more of the community engaging in the grand opening. Uh, one of the things that Luz, the owner, really has been focusing on is she she's working with a few local chefs and a lot of local farms to have um, a new menu and new offering. So she's she's developing this new menu offering and and as I've seen it happen as kids come in after school, instead of grabbing, you know, the bag of chips and the sugary drink, they'll grab one of these containers with fruit and vegetables. Here's a few more photos from the grand opening. Um, I should mention uh, the local city councilman was in attendance and we did work with him quite a bit on the sidewalk and some of the, the way that the facade kind of popped out to hide the security gate. That was something, you know, when you 
when you come into the sidewalk, you have to you have to liaise with the local officials. And we talked a lot about street lighting with him, and it was a great opportunity to engage kind of the local elected officials in this process. A few more exciting photos from the grand opening. There's Luz and Lupita. Um, I was speaking a little bit about uh, the menu that uh, Luz is developing. So we had the privilege of being able to do a bit of a menu testing day. So we went and she made us some of these great sandwiches that she's been developing for the market. Um, they're delicious. I, they're some of, some of the best sandwiches I've had. So I recommend them to everyone who's even remotely close to, to being in this area to swing by and get one of these sandwiches for lunch. And then um, they won this award with the city, this Good Food Champion Award. So this is this is the team celebrating that at um, City Hall. And the Yelp reviews. This uh, we actually we're not showing the previous reviews. They were all like one and two star reviews. They skyrocketed after the grand opening to much more positive reviews. So tracking some of the reviews in social media has been really exciting. And then really some of the most important impacts are the engagement with the community, the, the sales that the market's been doing increased by 50%. Um, you know, they hear anecdotally from the community that who, they used to go travel a long ways to go to a grocery store and now they feel like they can come to the Pizza's Corner to do a lot of their grocery shopping. Um, there's a lot of partnership with local um, and organic produce growers. So this is this is where some of this transitions from simply designing a space into impacting the community. And here's a slide that just shows the vast generosity of all of our partners. You see, you know, the team the team members from Gendler who are the core team, um, the what we what we considered the client, which was essentially the LA Food Policy Council and HNMN as well as um, the store owner herself, Luz, and then Build Group was the contractor. And at the bottom there, you see all sorts of vendors and donors who um, donated both their time and product to make this project happen. So I promised I'd come back to this facade. Um, you know, COVID has impacted all of us, um, not least of which the retailers um, of this country. And so, with, with this market, although it's a grocer and it was able to stay open, they couldn't do um, necessarily all the deli prep that they used to be able to do um, and serve fresh food, fresh um, menu items. They were impacted. They bounced back incredibly. They now offer this, um, I think it's weekly. They have a, almost a farmer's market, but with free food for the community. So anyone in the community can come by and get a bag of food from a local farmer's market at Lupinta's Corner for free. Um, so we at Gensler wanted to do something a little bit extra um, during the pandemic for this market. So we got together and said, you know, what about a mural? There's this kind of empty wall. Um, these were some of the goals that we had with the mural to communicate love, family, community. We wanted it to be minimal, but beautiful um, and really to have fun. So here's the process um, that we went through. It was a very quick design process and it was two days of painting. This is our um, Gensler studio team. And here's our final product. And it's something that speaks to um, the diversity of the community. It speaks to the healthy food and just kind of the fun and colorful nature of Luz and Lupita and the store itself. So thank you for listening and I'm happy to take questions. Thank you. Um, so looking at the, the list of, of um, questions that we already have. Well, one person told you that the vehicles appear to be from the early 1900s from answering your question. And then we have um, Laura, who uh, I will give uh, 
talk privileges, we can ask your question. Hi, Laura. Hey, um, I'm a landscape architecture professor at ASU and all of my students are here, so hey guys. Um, I was wondering, I mean, this is a pretty huge financial product that I'm, I was just wondering who paid for this. Great question, who paid for this? Um, so LA Food Policy Council, they are a nonprofit um, and they, they paid for part of it through their, the way they're set up, right? So they have, they have donors, they, they collect funds to be able to do projects like these. So a large portion of it was paid through, through the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network program with LA Food Policy Council. That's, that's who paid for it directly. Um, indirectly, there were a lot of groups uh, that donated time and materials and they did do a GoFundMe fundraiser to get some additional funds. Um, I will say like Build Group, for example, as they were in construction, they found a bunch of rotting around one of the existing windows and completely at cost to themselves, just replaced this entire window. They also bought them an air conditioner and installed that completely only at cost to Build Group, not at any cost to Lupita's. So there was, there's a lot of generosity um, and then a lot of fundraising. Thank you. Uh, next is Terry Baxter. We have a question. Looks like I'm on. Yes, you are. Oh, great. So I had a, I have, uh, I'm the design manager here at Arizona State University for the Herald Examiner project. And uh, one of the, it's not too far away from the site to the southeast of, uh, of this area along near 11th Street and Broadway. And uh, one of the things we talked about very early on was uh, engagement with the community. And so it's kind of interesting to see Gensler also working on this project. Um, I've got a couple questions though. One of which is, was the signage design done in house by your signage group? Yes, although not necessarily by our signage group, we have a graphic and um, like an environmental graphic designer within our studio group. And she was uh, the one who did it in Mia Park. Okay. And since I've, I've got the floor here, I was about ready to send a second question in. Go on. Which is, uh, oh, oh, well, I, if you don't mind, it's really quick and it's about yeah. the, the uh, uh, permits. So you, you said that you did this without any permits and obviously I'm working on a lot larger project, but how did you get by without an electrical permit? Obviously you've got new electrical fixtures and uh, so how, how did you get, get around that prospect or that, that requirement? Thank you. Yeah, we do have new fixtures and um, we did clean up a lot of conduit that actually was just not in use. It was a lot of, it went to like security cameras that never worked and things like that. Um, we, I mean, we met, we met with the, the local elected officials and we talked with the building department to just, you know, ask the question of where the tipping point was and we just didn't, we just didn't trigger that tipping point. <laughs> um, we have a question from an anonymous attendee, so I'll, <laughs> I'll say it. Um, so that, that person is curious about the watermelon. How does it play a role in Lupia, Lupia's market? The watermelon is a, um, a uniting vehicle for, for me to give this presentation. Um, I would say it plays a role in the project um, in so much as it is Lou's, the owner's favorite fruit. And one of the, one of the best selling products they have is agua frescas and they make a watermelon agua fresca that is fantastic. Um, and, you know, it is just kind of this like fun, playful, yet healthy icon. Hmm. Ricky. You're on. Hey, Ricky. Hello. Um, you had touched on land acknowledgement earlier on in your presentation. I wanted to know how that was incorporated into this project. Good question. It's not directly incorporated, it's more tangential. So the land acknowledgement is um, specifically for indigenous land. We didn't look at that during the design of this project, 
um, land acknowledgements in general um, for lectures, presentations, conferences, in many ways, they don't have to be relevant to the content. It really is um, recognizing land that we're currently occupying and sitting on. So um, for me, the connection is more tangential in that, you know, we did look at the history of the building and of the community and of the family that owns the project, but it's not directly linked to indigenous culture. Thank you. Um, and then we have Laura again. <laughs> Here we go. All right, a lot of questions. <laughs> so I wrote that my class is studying community engagement this semester, which is why we came to this lecture as well, and food. Um, we're working with the community garden. And so you mentioned a little bit that you met with the owner and the daughter, but can you speak a little more about your community engagement um, with this project and maybe even more broadly about on other projects, how Gensler gets to know a community that's not in their own and like co-creates and you know, just just generally about community engagement in your practice. Yeah, that's a really great great question and a broad topic. Um, for this project in particular, we spent a lot of time with Luz, the um, owner and daughter, and a fair bit of time with Lupita and her son to understand their family, to understand the history. Through those interactions, which oftentimes were at the store, we were able to meet community members as they came into the store and talk with them. This is also a project that got a lot of local press. So the news media actually interviewed the community and was, some of the things that we found out were through some of those news stories. It was fantastic. They interviewed um, the children from the schools who came came in and um, you know families that use the market. So it came from a lot of different places. We actually even have one, um, one of our one of my colleagues, he grew up in this neighborhood and remembered going to Lupita's when he was a kid. So um, we had someone in-house at Gensler who had a lot of history with this market. On a broader scale, I honestly think in terms of community engagement, it's something that we as a design community can do a lot better at. Um, I think when it happens, it happens usually on public projects, publicly funded projects or projects that are going into some sort of design review. So it's almost a required part of um, the process. One thing that we're working on at Gensler is finding ways to engage the community, whether through surveys or, um, you know, informal interactions or observation that uh, that's outside of a the typical scope of what designers and architects are doing. Um, you know, one thing that to, to speak a little bit on the idea of community engagement, one thing that I've heard um, designers and developers especially can get wrong is to try to engage communities without offering anything. Um, I think one thing that's important to understand is everybody who's in this community, their time is just as important as ours. So, you know, when, when we try to do focus groups or surveys or anything like that, there should be compensation involved for that time um, instead of asking for opinions and advice just for free from our community members. So um, that's that's a little bit what we do and a little bit what we're aiming to do. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll, Jose had a question, so I'll, I'll unmute. There you go, Jose. Yes. <clears throat> So, well, thank you so much for, for um, this uh, dialogue, um, Audrey. I have a question relative to um, how you select or what strategies you use to select topics that then will engage the community. Um, we are aware of the um, <clears throat> homelessness um, initiative that Gensler had, and we were um, able to visit the office here uh, for a lecture and dialogue with them about their projects. Um, and I see now this Lupita uh, Corner. How do you um, prioritize the needs or uh, decide how to not only engage with the community, 
but um, why you are doing it, if there is any larger uh, objective. I mean, I'm curious to know because many students, well, and many of uh, do this. I just curious uh, in the leadership role that um, that Gensler has in the world about design in general. What are the lessons that we can learn or our students can learn uh, about going on this goal of helping communities? I guess it's a rambling more than a, but I, I, I hope you get the yeah. question. I, I do, I think I think I understand what you're asking. And um, I would say that, that it comes from two general directions. The first is a lot of times it comes to us, like with um, with Lupita's market, it was it was this process of um, one of the I'm gonna see if I can remember this exactly. One of the board members of LA Food Policy Council was a previous client of ours on a project called Every Table, which I'd encourage everyone to Google Every Table. They have some really admirable. Um, social equity franchise models that they're starting right now. Um, I won't get into that, but the point is we had helped design these, um, uh, I think they're, they're sort of, they're grab and go fast casual restaurants um, with every table. And that client was on the board of LA Food Policy Council. So when one of these transformation projects came up, our name came up. And so they came to us and asked, would you be willing to donate services to work on this? So that's one direction is sometimes it comes to us because we're a big name, a lot of people know us. Um, the other thing that we often sort of reference to really decide how do we, what topics do we tackle is just, you know, our firm has been around for over 50 years. There's a lot of history of, you know, what we've prioritized over the years and what impacts that's made. So about, I wanna say three or four years ago, we had a, uh, we hired on a new director of community impact and she did a whole sort of survey of all the projects that Gensler has done around the world and what the priorities have been and why. And we, from that, we sort of zoom in on housing and homelessness, the next generation, so youth, um, health and wellness and the environment. And there's of course other categories that we'll do things here and there for, um, but those are the main four um, categories that we work on when it comes to community impact. Thank you. I just wanted very to tell you that um, after your view visit to our studio with Sherry and Olivier, the students was so impacted by the nature of addressing from the region to the sea to, to the interior that is our business in here. Uh, she have, we sent her project to the um, uh, Dongia Foundation that is this wonderful um, scholarship of $30,000. Um, she was one of the recipients. Uh, so um, better late than never, you, Audrey, and you people for <laughs> your office contributed to make uh, this very successful project a, you know, a successful uh, scholarship. Anyway, thank you so much. And, um, and there are a few more questions I see coming. So, That's wonderful, thank you. So another question from uh, Terry. Hey, Terry. Hi again. Uh, maybe I missed it, but how long did the remodeling take once you got in there and, and started working in the space? How, how long was the store closed? Um, the store was dark for, I want to say, five weeks, around that, four to six weeks. Okay, great. Thank you. And um, I don't see any questions, but I have one and then I'll, I'll, I'll end it to Sherry to close the, the discussion. But um, so, so when thinking about food and food and, and community, obviously uh, it, it's all about kind of a network of food and kind of thinking of, uh, of this, um, of 
Lupita's Corner as, as one step in, in a broader um, landscape of food or foodscape. So I, I wanted to know kind of how you had been thinking or if you had been thinking as uh, of this as something within kind of a broader network or is it, do you see this project as kind of a first step in, in other, um, uh, yeah, in other similar project within that, that specific community or kind of yeah kind of thinking beyond that project what what happens in a way yeah thank you um you know the food policy la food policy council and the healthy neighborhood market network that's that's their whole goal to make it this network of healthy neighborhood markets um and we've stayed in touch with them and you know kept up with the projects that they're working on i think mostly from just purely gensler it was it was more of an opportunity to work on community engagement. So the next project that we did wasn't specifically about food, but we actually did um, our most recent pro bono project that our studio took on was updating um, an office and event space for an LGBTQIA um, nonprofit group. And that was an interior um, update project. So, but we learned, you know, lessons from what we did on Lupita's in terms of community engagement and um, and sort of the whole process with all the stakeholders and applied those to new sort of philanthropic projects. Mm -hmm. um, before we wrap up, I did wanna kind of engage some of the students and ask a question of my own or maybe two. Um, I'm really curious after seeing this project and kind of hearing all the things I've been talking about, what would you do differently if this project was in Phoenix or in your hometown? I know that not everyone's in Phoenix, probably. Ooh, good. I don't know if if anyone wants to to answer, you can raise your vi virtual hand, and and I'll let you talk. So, do you have any? And I think the other thing that um, I would ask, although I don't know if there's like. A precise answer to this is this is the question we always ask when it comes to social justice projects, which is how much does design itself have an impact. Um, as I was talking, I did try to kind of highlight the times that design was impacting the community, but you know a lot of community um, and social impact work is outside the realm of design. So how do we as designers um, make the impact that we want. So that's that's another sort of question. Food for thought, or feel free to answer. So we have Jesse, who I just allowed to talk. <laughs> Hi. Um, yeah, I think that I mean, living in downtown Phoenix, which has a, a similar, I think, socioeconomic and sort of uh, environment that you know this store does. Um, it's something that I wonder how. Not that you could like copy and paste it, but it's like how can we engage in our own community and, um, you know, is Gensler working on that in Phoenix specifically to sort of emulate that, that project because obviously it had a positive impact and, you know, are those, are those lessons that were learned there, you know, then do you think replicatable in other places? Do I think the lessons are replicable? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> um, <laughs> or, or I guess like, do you foresee like a, a sort of clearer path to to make those kinds of things happen in the future for yourself at Gensler or outside of it? Well, um, you know, it's an interesting question. I think your question gets at the heart of an interesting challenge that I think some of the other design professionals on the call can relate to, which is um, we're not developers, right? So um, it's something that we've we've been working with, um, when I say we, I mean Gensler, in terms of the homeless situation is, you actually still need a client, right? So I think that's that's always the first step is how do you first identify these areas for opportunity? In a case like this, how do you how do you pinpoint where the markets that would even be willing and interested in participating in a program like this are located? And then how do you engage with them? Um, you know, I shared on one of the first slides that the Healthy Neighborhood Market Network program is much broader than simply a design update. Um, I focused on the design update, but there's there's a lot that has to do with business management. Um, actually, quick anecdote, before we worked on Lupita's, the um, HNNMN gave us a, a, a different site. It was, it was a different kind of like liquor store corner market type uh, bodega. And we started down a design path with them but LA Food Policy Council, 
council ended up deciding not to pursue the program with them because they were actually accepting very questionable loan products. And there's a lot of predatory mm -hmm. loan loans happening in these areas. And so they decided like they didn't abandon that project. They focused on the loan program with that market instead of focusing on design. So um, I know that doesn't answer your question, but it does get, the, get at the heart of how do we as designers capture these projects? It's business development, right? Yeah, yeah. And I think that you've touched on sort of the, that we're not developers and ultimately, you know, we can design everything with the best intention. But I think that that's something that as future designers, we need to keep in mind is that that's a hurdle that we're always going to face is because someone's going to want to make a bottom line dollar. And that's the reality of it. But something like this gives me hope. So thank you. <laughs> well, and it's not about the bottom line dollar necessarily. It's more about ownership and over the project. So since we're not actually the ones owning and being the client yet, who knows where the future will take us, um, we still need a client. Do we have anyone else who wants to add something to answer Audrey's question? Otherwise, I'm gonna pass it on to Sherry for a few concluding words. There is one more question. Um, oh, Jose, perfect. No, there is one more question, an anonymous attendee. Oh, yeah, I missed that one, sorry. I live I lived in a uh, in a mainly Hispanic community, though not me, but the, the anonymous attendee. But I would personally take the same design steps that Kessler did. One thing I would probably add more aspects that would remind Luz and Lupita of Ohms. So that was, one of the, the thing that one of the, the person was saying. Yeah, that's great feedback. Thank you. Okay. And I, I think that's, oh, we have Fifi. There you go. Hi. Um, I think the one thing that I would highlight more, um, just to really drive that point about really making the connection between the community and the food. Um, and the changing of behaviors of, of the people that are coming in is to highlight where the food is coming from. Um, I think that's something that could be done in a really interesting way through the design um, and can really get the people thinking whether it's the people operating um, the market or the people that are coming in to think about where their food is coming from, um, especially you know, now during a time when um, you know, where your food is coming from and what you're eating is getting more of a highlight and how much your food is traveling is getting more of a highlight as well. Um, so I think that's the one thing that I would do differently. I think it's even more important in Phoenix than it is in California because um, not as much of our food in Phoenix, in Phoenix comes from, um, from the farms that are around and a lot of the food is in, like comes from further away. Um, a lot of it from California, actually. Um, so that's what I would do differently. No, yeah, thank you. Um, actually, Luz has been doing exactly that. We um, we left a lot of like blackboard painted surfaces, and so she'll she'll note in chalk sort of you know where certain produce comes from, and then on that bulletin board she'll celebrate it that way. The the primary way she celebrates the sourcing is actually Instagram. Very cool. I'll have to check it out then. Thank you. <laughs> okay, now I think I'm not missing anyone else. So, Sherry, it's to you. Perfect. Um, so, thank you, Audrey. Um, I think that the project was um, inspirational, you know, as far as um, you know, what I really take away from it is that generosity. Um, you know, I, I know we spoke about a lot of different things, but really um, for me, it, you know, it seems like the root of it comes from people coming together um, and being generous and giving. Um, and, you know, that's what I hear a lot of um, as well. So, um, you know, and, and I think as, you know, with Gensler as a bigger firm and more opportunity presents itself to give, um, you know, that's commendable. 
And, and I think we're seeing that more with a lot of different organizations, a lot of different firms are doing that. And that's really encouraging um, and really, you know, wonderful direction. I think that, you know, you know, hopefully we will stay in continuing in that direction. So, um, so thank you so much for, you know, sharing that with us and exposing us to opportunity and hopefully, you know, doing more of that in the Phoenix Valley um, and, and nationally. So uh, thank you so much for joining us today, Audrey. Yeah, thank you for having me and thanks for the great uh, questions and discussion. Thank you and thank you everyone for joining us. Um, have a good rest of your day and studio for those of you who are going to studio. So. I did pop um, a link to a video if you want to hear more from Luz and uh, about her family. It's a six minute YouTube video if anyone wants to grab that from the chat. Uh, Audrey, uh, thank you so much. Um, the, next, the next lecture that um, will be a speaker from uh, London, and I hope you can join us that day. Olivia, would you like to remind to the audience the yeah. next, uh, lecture? So uh, we have, we force Audrey to attend. I mean, no, <laughs> you will love that lecture is um, connected to connected to your conversation in a different aspects. And to Melania, yes, we will have access to the um, recording, uh, the questions that just pop up uh, in, in few days, yes. Um, yeah. And, and Ray, yeah. I, I wanted to also say, Ray, if you are there, um, thank you so much because you made all of this possible. Anyway, um, yeah, and I'll just say, so as, as Jose said, for everyone, please join us uh, on March 3rd for Joe Boys, um, who was a, one of the founder of Matrix uh, Feminist Architectural Co-op in the 80s in London, and has since been working on uh, disability and design, and especially kind of rethinking and challenging the way that we address uh, disability and design with the disordinary project that she's been working for the past decade. So she's she's one of the, the most important thinker about this in, in the world. So we're really, really, really happy to have her coming uh, virtually with us next week. So make sure, uh, not next week, but in two weeks. So make sure you, you join us then. So, oh, there we go. Bye everyone. Thank you. Bye.